So, welcome everybody to another live science stream from the Wolfram Institute. Uh, today, it will be myself and uh, Uti discussing the stage of the infrageometry project, and uh, in particular, we'll be looking at uh, progress that we've been making in the front of uh, weighted derivations and the discrete uh, version of tangent structure. So today, uh, Jonathan Kodar uh, was not able to join us. Uh, we are in the middle of a scramble to set up the um, relaunch event next week, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to report on many exciting directions um, next Tuesday. So uh, keep an eye out for an announcement of uh, specific timings, but um, around afternoon for Eastern, um, Eastern uh, Central American time, you will be uh, able to find us online. So without further ado, let's uh, get into what uh, we have been up to. Um, on my end, uh, I, should, uh, I should mention that uh, the infrageometry program at the moment is mostly focusing on analyzing the structure that naturally arises from, um, from the discrete version of tangent uh, constructions in manifolds. So uh, as many of you uh, would have known from past streams, we effectively capture the notion of a manifold as a set of vertex points and the notion of connectivity in a manifold or place or space in a manifold as some graphic structure on top of it. Um, so in the simplest case of, uh, of an undirected graph, uh, we, we thought of the paths, uh, sort of the path space of that graph will be analogous to the curved space of a, of a manifold. And we try to push this analogy further by identifying uh, directed edges with tangent vectors and the tangency between curves with, um, you know, some, some equivalences between such discrete paths. Um, so one of the early sort of notifications uh, or or one of the early, um, I guess, realizations, I should say, that uh, we encountered when doing this discrete tangent structure was that the most obvious generalization of a directional derivative, that is uh, what in this context can only be a finite difference uh, operator, uh, which in, in the continuous case can be made into, a, into an infinitesimal uh, derivation or vector field. In, in, in the discrete case is what we call the um, find a difference operator. Uh, we realize that those uh, appear very naturally in, in our context and they carry the structure of what is called a weighted derivation, which is a slight generalization from ordinary der derivations, which, as many of you know, satisfy the so called Leibniz property or product rule, where they uh, apply to a product by distributing over, over the two or to the, the two elements being multiplied. So <clears throat> um, we, we noticed this, uh, this property of, of uh, the, ana the analog of derivations on uh, discrete manifolds. And uh, we, we've been effectively researching on, on this on, on these objects. Uh, they are called weighted derivations in the, in the literature. They have been studied in the uh, area of Rota-Baxter operator, operators and uh, differential algebras. So um, as, a, as a very uh, sort of familiar example to a lot of our listeners uh, will be that you find that the simplest example of a Rota-Baxter differential algebra is that of uh, functions of one variable and the derivative and antiderivative constructions uh, in, in usual calculus. So the derivative uh, satisfies uh, obviously a derivation property. So the, der the derivative is a differential. Um, and the antiderivative, which you can imagine is uh, the indefinite integral construction, um, satisfies some um, product rule for, for integration. And the fact that these two are inverses of one another uh, is what uh, defines a rather Baxter differential algebra. And, and so um, this, uh, when, when instead of considering uh, the infinitesimal versions or the limit versions, which is you know, the, the usual derivative and the usual uh, Riemann integral or any, any uh, equivalent integral, um, you, you end up with uh, a, an actual uh, de derivation and a, a product rule that, that applies 
with, with uh, only the two terms. But when you leave your operators uh, finite, meaning that you don't take any limits, so you don't take infinitesimal differences for the derivative, or you don't take uh, sort of arbitrarily small di divisions of a Riemann integral, but you actually do a finite sum uh, sort of definition, you re retain a finite uh, interval as you're, as you're adding a uh, step, um, you actually end up in this uh, more general territory. So, so it's not that you lose all the structure, you actually still retain uh, largely the, the same shape of, of the behavior, but now you are in, in this context of weighted, uh, weighted operators. Um, so that's one way to, uh, to, to, for, for the audience to have an idea of where these objects can be found in a very natural environment. You, you don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to uh, come up with something very um, convoluted to, to, to end up with something, with, to end up with this weighted derivations or, or and weighted uh, antiderivations. But we're going to be looking at weighted derivations uh, today. Um, so yeah, so in our context, we found them as the analog of vector fields or, or one of the natural analogs of vector fields in discrete spaces in our discrete model of, of manifolds where we're trying to uh, correlate uh, continuous smooth uh, geometric structure on the one hand with graphic structure on finite sets um, or discrete sets. So anyway, that's a little bit of the introduction. That, that, that is our sort of uh, current focus. And uh, Uti here with us uh, is going to be a visiting fellow uh, for for the for the next couple of months at least in the, in the institute and we are, we're going to be looking at these particular structures and as part of, of his project to do with infrageometry so uh, perhaps uh, we could hear from him uh, what he's been up to and uh, get get some update on that on that front and then after that maybe we can do some live science as as this uh, e live stream actually suggests. Sure. Um, so here here one. Um... I think Carlos summed it up pretty nicely where we're going. Uh, it's it's. I mean, the if you if you watch the last live stream, the notion of a discrete derivative or a discrete derivation was pretty natural, um, because it just meant that we weren't taking the epsilon to go to zero, which is where finiteness comes in. As soon as you take the edge length to be like we took the edge length to the epsilon, in in the last in the last live stream, and if we take the edge length to zero we should get the ordinary derivative. But the point of this is to add, not only just take limits of a discrete space, but to define analogous notions of tangent spaces on discrete manifolds. And we take the limit of those tangent spaces rather than the, um, rather than like the edge length or so on, so that we have like a very nice correspondence um, between discrete geometry and continuous geometry. So I think I can share my, um, I can, I have a writing tablet and I can share what I've been up to because I think it's it's much easier if I write those equations or whatever Absolutely. down rather than. Yes, please go ahead. Sure. So just give me a moment. Is the background noise too much? It was very hard to find it like a, a quiet place again. So I apologize if there's no, this background noise. Background noise is fairly under control. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, right now uh, we have a notion. We start with a graph. With any, actually, let's draw like the most easiest graph we can think of. It's a trivial one, which the hope is that it reduces to the real numbers, or in this case, R two, when we take a appropriate limit. So let's say we have like a like a grid of thing. Right? So in normal manifold, uh, in in ordinary defensive geometry, what we do is we start with a point, uh, on a manifold. So over here, a graph is instead of vertices, we take this. the points in our manifold over here, like the discrete manifold. The points are essentially the vertices. And so what happens in a manifold is that. We at each point there is a notion of like there is a notion that the manifold is continuous, and the reason why the, the continuity shows up 
is because um, we use we basically map like in the definition of math we have a chart and we have an atlas and so we implicitly use the I mean we implicitly use the properties of the real numbers or in in an n-dimensional manifold Rn to define the the topology on on the manifold and that's the reason why continuity shows up and so which is I think one of the issues that I like to raise later on that that if you have a function on a graph how do we how do we make sure that it's smooth in, in like the in like the limit because derivations are only the kind of I, as maps from smooth functions in manifold rather than um, just any function. So for now, let's deal with like any function. So we define our function space. We just set up all functions from the vertices to the real number. We can use M, like some other field as well, but for now, I think let's use the real numbers. And so these are the set of all functions from the vertices to the real number. And in, in ordinary uh, defined geometry, the way we have a direction is that we essentially what we're doing is we're just taking all the possible paths through our vertex. That's what intuitively it means. But more precisely, uh, what it means is that we're just considering the set of all maps uh, that go from the function space to the reals. And uh, in ordinary uh, differential geometry, these are called the set of all derivations um, at a point. So what it does, it, it takes a function and tells us how it changes along, like along uh, at that point. And the way it changes depends on the path. So it turns out there's a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between the set of all paths and the set of all ways in which the function can change at a particular point. And it has to satisfy this this, this nice property, uh, which is the line of um, Okay, so what we did is, is that the way that we actually prove that the set of all derivations, uh, the set of all maps on a on a smooth manifold corresponds to these directions, precisely uses a very nice property of the real numbers, which is which is like the Taylor series. We use the we use Taylor series to prove that on the real number, like on R n, the set of all these derivations, they have a very nice basis, which correspond to exactly the basis vector assumption, um, which is like. Uh, the basis vectors are labeled this. So essentially, d by dxi is a is is an operator that tells us how a function changes along the coordinate axis. And I feel like this is a very like a like it uses very it uses the property of the real numbers here. Uh, but we know that on the straight cases, this will not always be the case. So I do not expect that you know there is a one to one correspondence between um like between the coordinate bases and like you know the, the possible derivation of that. so this is just an introduction into what we have been up to recently and um so now um it was in in the last live stream we showed that the in in the discrete case the derivations do not obey this instead they obey like so far some other property, uh, which is, which is, um, which is this, uh, uh, Carlos, I think this is the right one, right? Like the, like the, yep. the way to derivation. Yeah, that's the weight one. Yep. Yeah, this is the weight one derivation. Um, in terms of like the uh, the the like the the like the thing that takes a function to like the real numbers, and so what I decided to do is this seems to have like this this has a nice algebraic it, it looks nice algebraically speaking. So you have these linear terms and then you have a quadratic thing over here. So the natural thing that I decided to do is find like the algebraic structure of these 
uh, so that it can probably help us in some way in the future to understand the, the structure of these discrete standard structures. Yes. So now let's get to that, the good stuff. So there are a few properties that, you know, keep these, these weighted derivations satisfied. And the first thing is that if I have, so over here, let's not specifically think about a maps from functions on a graph to the real numbers. Let's just think in like a more abstract sense where I talk about the set of all derivations in like an algebra A. So we can denote them by this. The set of all weight derivations of weight W in our algebra. And these are essentially the set of all functions. Um, such that um, um, but here key linear maps. So essentially maps as like linear maps and vector forces. So that it satisfies this identity. Right. So um this is what it satisfies. And the natural question to ask is that is does this form subspace? And the answer is no. Because if I add two of these together, sorry, there, there should be a W sign over here. My, mainly today, I think the main the, the results I have are for W is equal to one, but I guess they can be generalized. So we can easily see, and this is an exercise to the viewer if, if possible, that if you add two of these W derivations, the result is not a W derivation because this, this entire term messes it up because it's a quadratic term. Um, so the sum of two of these is not a derivation. And similarly, if you take the tensor product of two operators, which is defined as, uh, so let me write it completely. If F is inside this, and if G is inside this, then F tends to G, um is a map from uh this and oh sorry it's inside this and it takes two things and it gives you this and we can and it's easy to show that this is valid enough. even this is not uh if f and g are w derivations, even f tends to g is not a w derivation. Similarly, f composed with g is also not a w derivation. And f composed with g minus g composed with f. f composed with g is also not a w derivation. This is not a w derivation. This is not a w derivation. So immediately, like, the most basic things don't work out. Because and there, if you think about them, they're very, it's easy to see why it doesn't work out because of this extra quadratic term. So right now, the most natural question to ask is that what operation um, can you do with like two derivations, two W derivations, so that the result is a W derivation, or even some other derivation with some other value for W, even that would be very similar. Um, and for now, I haven't been able to figure out what the exact thing is. Um, it seems it seems like it seems very weird. Like it, it seems that it should be straightforward, but I think if you work it out on your own. Uh, like a few things, uh, like a few examples. It's not that straightforward. So um, we can probably do like an exhaustive search using the axiomatic system of Mathematica to iterate over all possible, right? Not all possible, but the nice looking or like the symmetric, um, uh, from, like polynomials in F and G, um, so that the resultant polynomial when F and G are W relations is another global relation. That's, I think, one of the things we can do today. Uh, so now I'm just going to tell you like a few results about these W derivations. The first nice result that I have is that the map that takes A to minus A is a W is a derivation with weight 1. The second nice fact that I have is that if phi is an algebra homomorphism, so it's a vector space uh, homomorphism, so it's a linear map, and also it respects the multiplicative structure. Then, 
minus identity plus phi. So the sum of two linear maps is a linear map. This is inside of this. So this is a linear map. And also, this is a derivation of weight one. And it is like we can work this out very quickly with this. So minus identity plus phi. If I do phi of AB, uh, if I write it out, that becomes minus AB plus phi of AB. And that's phi of A phi of B minus AB. So if this is a W derivation, this should be uh, A times this plus this times this plus this times this. And so if we do this quickly, like, I mean, we can just do it. Um, plus minus A times A minus B. Plus minus a minus b, minus b, plus b. And so, so I see that I get a minus a b over here, and I get a minus a b over here, and I get plus a b over here. So I get a minus two a b plus a b. So I get a minus a b over here. Plus, I get an a phi b over here, and a phi a b over here. But then. I get a minus a phi b over here, which cancels this out, and I get a minus phi a b over here, which cancels this out. And then, so I'm only left with these, out of this. And so this is indeed a, a derivation with weight one. And so then the natural question to ask next is that, in given an algebra, in, in any given algebra, how many of these one derivations do this do this cover? Like if you take all possible algebra homomorphisms phi, and then you subtract the identity from it. Does it span all the possible derivations of weight one? So that's one question to ask. And so it's a, it's, it's a very hard question to just answer out of the blue because surely it should depend on the original algebra. And so I tried to prove, I tried to see what the result goes for like the polynomial ring Kx, where K is the field. Then I, uh, Indeed, it turns out that in this case, all non-trivial derivations, all non-trivial one derivations, are of the form minus identity plus phi, where phi is an algebra homomorphism from k of x to k of x, right? And so I can just quickly skim through the proof of this. Like it doesn't really provide much valuable intuition, but just for the sake of being rigorous, uh, the proof of this is like the same way you prove all the possible normal W is equal to zero derivations of K of X, is that you basically like, if you, you assume that there exists a W derivation, then you come up with some restrictions on the possible values of the W derivation. So, um, then there are like some cases. And then the most, like the nicest thing about Kx is that it's it's generated by only one element, like the algebra, and generated by x, uh, right? So, and, it ha and as a vector space, it has a countable basis. So if you want to create a linear map from k of x to k of x, it just makes sense to, it, it, it's basically equivalent to mapping each of these basis elements to some other elements. So now, if I impose a condition that if f is a linear map from k of x to k of x, which is also a one derivation, then if I can figure out f of x, and let's say I give it like any, let's say it's any other polynomial inside k of x, it's some, any element in k of x, then to figure out x, f of x squared, I can use the condition that it's a, it's a weighted derivation. And so I get something like this, right? And so it's immediately clear that you can just keep on doing this until like for all of these n. And so basically I just need only the first value f of x, uh, which is like some polynomial p of x. And then uh, I get all the possible derivations 
um uh so like it turns out so um it turns out that even to figure out all the possible algebra homomorphisms from kfx to kfx it suffices since it is generated by one element it suffices to uh, know what it what it's an x to and then the rest of it immediately follows and so the set of all algebra like one derivations are of this form um over here now if we look at the set of all zero derivations so just the ordinary derivations then the set of all these derivations are essentially uh, of this form you can also prove this well p of x is the polynomial that we have any polynomial and d of x d by dx is the is the derivative operator so these are the set of all zero derivations in of kx and in the case of one derivations it's phi all the set of algebra homomorphisms minus the identity so but note that each algebra homomorphism is specified by only one polynomial namely polynomial which sends x2 and so like all of these the uh, all of these so like there is a so in in a sense there is a one one correspondence between the set of all zero derivations and the set of all one derivations uh which sends p of x so if you have any zero derivations you can send the p of x of that derivation to the algebra homomorphism which is generated by the set of equations so there is a bijective corresponding to p of x. so that tells us a nice thing that zero derivations are really not that special um you can also have a non trivial class of uh, uh derivations of like arbitrary weights in this case weight one i so i'm just going to write down the next step for me so this is what i've done till now uh so also by the way i think of uh, an interesting fact to write down is that if you have an if you have any algebra uh a which is an f is a weighted derivation as well that's a linear map that satisfies the kw identity then you can eas easily prove that f of 1 is either zero or and this is the assumption that they use in the rota back so i have read it properly so uh whatever carlos mentioned i think they use this um uh, property implicitly yeah uh, because uh, this is also satisfied by the derivative of so i guess they want to maintain that property of weighted derivations i don't know why and i guess that's what we have to do next um or it can also satisfy so this is like an extra thing that we have which we do not have in 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 weighted derivations in sorry in weight zero derivations that is minus 1 by w yep and you can prove that very easily by just using the condition of weighted derivation yes and so <clears throat> in weight 1 i have f1 is minus 1 right and so i mean and this like is is consistent with the fact that phi minus n is always like a a, a weighted derivation of weight 1 because if i apply it to 1 then i get phi of 1 minus the identity of 1 and phi is being the algebra homomorphism must send 1 to 1 so it's 1 minus 1 and so it's zero um, did i do this one I think you want Yeah, I think it's I'm not sure. I I I'm, I mean since you've mentioned this uh correspondence I'm a bit confused. Um So I mean so one thing's for sure that are you saying that but are you saying that homomorphisms of of a polynomial algebra are just given by yeah. polynomials Yeah the is that true uh, Wait what, what do you say sorry that that um a homomorphism of a of a ring of polynomials kx right Yeah is given by a by a polynomial itself Yeah, or because, like, let's say you have like a algebra homomorphism from k of x to k of x, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So 
let's say 5x is like some point of the other x then then 5x squared it must be 5x whole squared pfx squared and so similarly for 5x and, and any polynomial in k of x is just like a sum of the of, of this form right and so since it's, it's an algebra homomorphism it's also added to it and so so phi this should be like this and we know that this is just p of x to the end so it's essentially just this so essentially what it's actually doing is an algebra homomorphism uh of like a polynomial ring it takes a polynomial q so over here q was this right? and it just evaluates q at p of x that's it like over here q was like ai xn so i'm just substituting p of x over here uh, in, in, in place of this x and it's very easy to show that this is true for all algebras gen that are generated by one element um, that it's just going to be this evaluation of um, all those and so and and also in the case of zero derivation which are the of the derivatives uh, obviously we know that d of dx is a is a zero derivation but we can also multiply it by any other p of x as an operator and this would also satisfy the line of yeah and so you can prove that these are all this these are all the set of zero derivations on kfx and then i am also shown that the set of all one derivations of kfx are of this form because phi is an algebra homomorphism um right so wait 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 so let, let me understand I mean, the, the part on the on the, on the zero derivations is obvious um, that, that that we we see clearly, but I'm I'm still not following the the one to one correspondence with the with the polynomials. I mean, okay. Um, the, so you're saying that 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 if you have a, I mean, I can see how you have a phi that is equivalent to evaluating a polynomial. Yeah. So phi. So that. So okay. So the. So you can just create a bijective correspondence. So these are like algebra homomorphisms. So there is a bijective correspondence between this and K of S itself. Uh, right? Where P is sent to like this evaluation map that I talked about. Evaluation map of P, which takes some element which is like a map from this to this that takes some q and evaluates it at p as a polynomial and you can easily show that this is this has to be a one-to-one -one map um, but we also know that there is a one-to-one -one map between the sort of all derivations so zero derivations from k of x to k of x to k of x um, and so there's a one to one person in this as well, where it sends p of x d by dx to p of x. Right? And so this is obviously a bijective map. Because these are all the set of possible zero derivations you can have. No, I, like I it's even, part. I, I'm, I'm just. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what is the doubt? No, my, 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 my is just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to. To work out in my head why I mean evaluation of P doesn't I mean doesn't it, it's not linear on, on KP right on KX right uh, no no this map is linear because if I take like Q plus Q prime let's say this is mapped with Q Plus Q prime of P. So no, no, like, I, I understand. You take you take the sum. I, I understand that, but the yeah. image. I mean, the image map of so Q itself, right? Yeah. Q itself has to be a. It has to be a, if it's if it's to be a homomorphism, right? No, Q isn't a homomorphism. Uh, yeah, you're right. 
if you was a pawn master it can have higher degree term right? so it's not linear but uh this itself was a linear like uh like the evaluation okay so okay so essentially no, I, see, I see what you mean i see what you mean because like polynomials have this nice structure so if i have phi of let's say x let's say phi is an algebra homomorphism and so assume that i have this right? and then if i demand this to be an algebra homomorphism phi of x to the n must be p of x to the n right? so sure. and also it is additive so any polynomial under phi must be sent since it's linear so if a i are in k so it's like it goes outside and so it's 5x to the n. So it's, we know that it's px to the n. But this sure. is just like x replaced with yeah. pfx. Yeah. So, so it just turns out that this is the case. And it's not that special. It turns out it's just the case in every algebra that's generated by one element. If I had x comma y, then this two would not be true. Okay. So, I mean, it's not that really that relevant. So just in mathematics. So, um, yeah, yeah, I was I was just making 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 yeah. sense of the, the notation. Yeah, that's clear. Um, so the set of all derivations or non-trivial derivations are of this form, and the trivial derivation is this minus the element uh, where where pi is just like zero map. Um. Wait, but I don't think that's algebra homomorphism. Zero map isn't to algebra homomorphism, right? Well. No, it's not. It depends on. I mean, if you don't consider the unital condition. Yeah, I'm. I am like in my definition of algebra homomorphism. I want the multiplicative identity to be sent to the multiplicative identity. Right. In that case, like there is the, essentially there is a unit in the algebra. In that case, in that case, no. But but yes. Oh yeah, I mean it's like it's pretty obvious that like if there is a nice like you know, like there is a nice correspondence over here. Uh, like I thought, like I originally thought, uh, my intuition said that the set of all one derivations would be like more restricted uh, because it's easy to see that the set of all zero derivations. Are, are all determined by one polynomial, so it's isomorphic, it's bijective, with equal in size to pfx. I did okay. not expect that. I thought it's going to be smaller than pfx, but it's going to be Yeah, so, no, that's that's interesting. So, so, so that that's an interesting fact of uh, of kx. But what happens in kxy, for example? Yeah, so exactly. Answer can be wrong. So that's the thing that I haven't done yet. Um, so. Over here, I didn't really explicitly use any properties of the field. Okay? Like I did not use that the field has some characteristic. Implicitly, I might have, but I didn't assume that the field has like division and stuff like that. Just purely algebraic properties. So I think that this might hold true for R of X as well, where R is like an integral domain. Uh, so if, if the viewers don't know what it is, integral domain is when like if you have A times P is equal to zero, then it must imply that one on one. Is zero. So the reason I want it to be an integral domain is because, like, I think in my calculation, I implicitly assumed a lot of like this assumption, a lot of the time, which is what we used to assume in high school and stuff. So uh, the next step would be to show that, like, like what's the set of all derivations here, where R is like a ring, or like an integral domain, and you have R x. Given that we know like all the W derivations in R, so uh, yeah, that's the that's the next step. And if I can show this, then the this case will be actually to answer. Um, all right. Uh, mm. I guess this would not be that trivial because in my definition, I assume that a weighted derivation is going to be like a map from k of x to k of x and it's going to be linear in k. But like a linear map from r of x to r of x, um, I, I mean, I can, I, I, I don't even require like 
this to be algebra, right? In this entire definition, I've assumed that I have an algebra rather than a ring, and the algebra has an extra structure of a vector space. And I, I guess the reason I chose it as a vector space is because, you know, we have tangent spaces and stuff, so we must have vector spaces and fields and stuff like that. So it makes sense to have that. But R of X doesn't really need to have a vector space structure. So an interesting question to ask is if R is an arbitrary ring, then it, I think it's going to be a non-trivial to answer this. Uh, because, like, over here, I just assumed that if I have a polynomial, a0 plus a1, etc. A0 and a1 still being elements in K and being linear map, these are like untouched. So uh, it might not hold in this case. So it's, I guess it might be more tricky to work that out. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. I wouldn't worry too much about relaxing the field condition. In, yeah, I mean, in a single so, volume. Yeah, we can, like, we can always start, I mean, the way the thing goes, we start from, like, very nice structures and see what we can generalize. So we have done T of X. So I guess next we can try, like, A of X where A is an algebra or something like that. Like, I, 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 I mean, I think the, 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 re, the real informative, the real sort of, um, sort of the template, the, the template examples that we really want to explore are the k x y, right? So because the usual, I mean, it's an interesting result. I mean, polynomials on x um, having this having uh, so a correspondence between derivations and I mean one derivation and zero derivations. It's, it's interesting, but the problem the problem with um, I mean, the reason why x, kx is not very interesting is that uh, as a Lie algebra, it's the zero algebra, right? Precisely yeah, because it's it's precisely because it's one dimensional, right? Sorry. Precisely because it's one dimensional, right? So you, uh, any any one dimensional Lie algebra is zero. Mm. Right. Uh, one second. You have, oh yeah, yeah, okay. You see? Um, yep. Um, so sorry, what was the wild algebra again? What was, uh, I guess it was this, right? That was the wild algebra. Yes, I guess so, yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, for, we can, we can but I, I'm stuff. stating something more elementary than that. What, okay. I, what I'm saying is, um, you know, anytime you have a ring, you have its the algebra of derivations. This is already guaranteed. Similarly, if you have an yeah. algebra, you will get a, an actual algebra, uh, an actual Lie algebra, meaning your bracket is bilinear, right? It's, it's bilinear in um, in the field in the field yeah. of multiplication, right? So, mm -hmm. in the case of uh, the polynomials or even uh, the functions over over uh, a real variable, right, in general, um, your Lie algebra happens to be, because you, as, you, as you mentioned, there's one element that generates them all. So it's a, it's a one-dimensional Lie algebra, right? Yeah. So because it's one-dimensional, uh, you are effectively, I mean, you, you're effectively doing a bracket over a one-dimensional space, so you can check that because of the, because of bilinearity, the most general uh, bracket that you can write is of the form, you know, component times basis element plus component or, or, or together with component times basis element. And by bilinearity, you end up with something that is proportional to the bracket of basis element, basis element. But because the bracket is anti-symmetric, that is obviously zero, right? So so the one, one dimensional Lie algebras always have zero Lie bracket. So that's that's what I mean by them being zero. It's not that they are the zero algebra in the sense that they are not the zero vector space, but but they have the zero bracket. The zero bracket is a good Lie bracket. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but it's a boring one, right? So so it, it might be. It's interesting. This this coincidence uh, of sure. of. No, uh, I agree with you. Uh, that should be like, yeah, I and mean, that's the next step. Because, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know whether I used any properties of Lie algebras over here. Um, 
No, I don't, I'm not like, saying you, you, you did. What I'm saying is that in the case, like from what we know of, of, of derivations in, in one variable, we yeah. know that it's not very useful to, when you forget about the multiplicative structure of your, of your space, right? It's not very useful to think of derivations at all because they don't do anything else than, than just be derivations on the variables, right? But when you go to, to, to other settings, like, you know, functions of two variables and functions of, on two dimensional spaces, suddenly derivations do more because then you can ask about commutativity of, of the derivations. So that, that's a, it's a non-trivial question, right? Okay, I mean, so like you mean like the commutativity of, of like d by dx, d by dy, I think. Yes. I think there assumes the community of I guess when I want to in in like the n-dimensional y y algebra. Yeah, but so the so the, the, the basis is commutative, but the, all the derivations are yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean like in the y algebra, like the y algebra is essentially like in this um like um, we don't really have x y minus y x being zero, and p of x y is like even more gentle. It's just this, right? So yeah, I mean there are a lot of interesting things we can do with that. And generalize it. And it's fine some examples. But I think I think it would be quite interesting to. To simply think about, I mean, what, what the analogous result is in K X Y, right? Like the commutative one, this one. The analogous result of of what you found, but there is it happens to it happens to be um, there happens to be a correspondence between zero derivations and one derivations in in the field. In yeah, the that would of, be quite interesting, though. So, so that. That is a very natural extension. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah sure. So, well, what are all the derivations in case x y? Is it just like the set of all, like, uh, like the set of all linear combinations of these or something? So I'm not sure actually. Um, I would say so. Wait, I can tell you. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I guess that's, I, I think that's why it will work. Um, I think, hmm. but I mean, hmm. that's exactly right. Okay, uh, but I have a question. Uh, in in the differential geometry, these derivations do form a basis. Of not, our... not not globally, only only in charts. Sorry, yeah, in, in like in like one tangent space. Uh, like it's, you can prove that yes. if it, yeah, if you have x1, x1 as a coordinates on a chart, then uh, then d by dx1, etc. are basis of, of the chart. Um, but yeah. that explicitly uses properties of the views. Right? Like, at least what I know, at least the proofs that I've read about, uses, it just first of all, it first proves that d of dx1, d of xn in Rn is a basis. And proving that is not trivial itself because it uses like, some data series stuff. Uh, and the property of derivations of it being satisfying the, of the Leibniz rule, which simplifies a lot of the calculations. Mm -hmm. And then it, it 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 uses that Taylor series thing. Um, yeah. So I mean, what I wanted to ask you was that even let let's say we like figure out some stuff about W derivation and so on, surely is going to be useful. Oh, yeah, no, um, like, what's the next step? I I guess the next step would be for right now in the live streams to figure out. Like some geometrical stuff, right? Like right now, it's just algebra. Well, I mean, the thing is, we what you found, what you found for the for the K, KX case is is quite interesting. I mean, on the face of it, saying that zero derivations and one derivations are in one to one correspondence, that is that is fairly interesting. I mean, the more, the, but but you know, the, the main question that we had last time and that we are trying to answer, which is what is the what is the algebraic structure of this finite difference operators on discrete spaces, as, as we're trying to generalize, right? Which is common to continuous and discrete manifolds. Um, the the question was, what is the algebraic structure there, right? So we, in the particular example that you found, it so happens that 
that you know this correspondence um, does not see it does not see the Lie bracket because the Lie bracket is zero. Therefore, you know if you define the zero bracket for for uh, for derivatives for sorry for weighted derivatives, well that's a good bracket because it is a Lie bracket. I mean you can given any space you can always define a Lie bracket by by you know or given any algebra you can always give it a zero a Lie bracket by giving the zero bracket right. This is true for some for some algebras right that you can always do that. Um, so the problem that we have is what, what maybe actually going back to the K, 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 the KX case for a second is that so does that bijection respect additivity? Because that would be interesting to see. I mean, that shouldn't be very complicated. It's just off the top of my head, I can't do the computation in my, in my, my mind's eye. But but you, you you clearly have a bijection. We, I agree with that. The question is, do you have a... It, it, I don't think it can specify to me because... Uh, yeah. I mean, let's say that there is like a... I mean, so obviously you know there's a bijection. And so let's say it sends the sum of two derivations and the sum of two of these double derivations, but the sum of them, two double derivations, is not my... It's not a double derivation. So it cannot be adequate. Um, yeah, but so, so that's interesting, right? So that that's what I that was what I was, what I was referring to. That um, I mean, we know do we know this positively? Do we know that two two derivations? I mean, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, you were saying? Yeah, sorry. So so is it true that two derivations? Um, I mean, if they are all of the form phi plus. So I guess minus identity. Yeah. So notice how if you if you if you try to do it right. So well, imagine that you okay. So let's do a little exercise. Imagine that you have two derivations of kx. Yeah. So you you show the most general form of them is phi minus uh, infinity, right? Yeah. So when you add those those two, right? What you get is something yeah. that looks like a phi minus two twice the identity. Yeah. Right. So all you have to do in, in that case is instead of adding, you have to take the average, so to speak. Right. So you, I mean, ah. Right. So if you take the average, um, you're going to have average of some home maps minus identity. Now, the average of two home maps is a linear combination of home maps. So it's a home map. That's a nice observation. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, so that's a, that's an interesting that's an interesting thing, right? Like, yep. So you're saying if I have then if I if I add them together, yep. I get this exactly. So and then if I yeah, that works out really nice thing too. Precisely. So, in, so if you define the operation, the binary operation on on one derivation, that is, take the average, right? In this case, it closes, right? So we try for arbitrary, just for fun. Like you want to try? Sure. Uh, before I think, hmm. um, right, okay, so we can continue. So, okay, so if I have let's say f and g are one derivation, let's try to find them. and divided by two. Let's see, so I get. Okay. Oh wait, how 
how do we even define by it? No idea we can be correct. Yeah, assume they are algebras. Okay, so now I get Sorry, plus Okay. This is right. Okay. And then what I want this to be is I want this to be. Basically, you use boss to like So I'm pretty, it's, it's quite obvious to me that it's not going to work. Um, but I mean, we, we can see like what term is needed to know that. We, we know, we know what's missing. So we, we already know this. Um, I think you did the computation and this is the same computation as when you're checking the failure of addition uh, and noticing that you have additivity of weighted derivations up to a term that looks like F A times G B plus F B. Uh, times GA. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. So, so th this waiting by something is it, it clearly feels like a this, this is a this is a phenomenon of one variable. Hmm, that's a nice point. Um, okay, just for my own sanity. Sure, sure. I want to um, see where it goes. And I want to go to the end. I have a policy on it. Let's go to the end. Yeah. I have one by four. Yep. So, okay. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. But, here, right? Um, do this. Um, the other one. Um, I'm just, I'm just very slow at calculation. No, no. I mean, uh, so. I am slow as well. I just, we just did this. I, I did this computation. Okay. <laughs> I mean, in the ordinary like additivity case, uh, this like cancels out. This would cancel out, and this would cancel out because we don't have the half sign. But over here, it doesn't cancel. Out, which is kind of interesting. So assume that it actually is a W variation, a one variation. Then we get some yeah. nice condition. Because they know it's bad. Oh. Like the term was worth like some different percent. Because, okay. So if we want the addition of two derivations, the one derivations to be zero, then we get like the condition that FAGB plus GAFA, which is the extra term of the world, this is zero. But like we don't really over here we probably we get a bigger condition, but maybe that's that's nicer in, in a way. Um, that, wait, did I just do the wrong calculation? What half minus four half minus one by four is what? Oh it's one by four. Yeah. Uh, yeah, see, you get like a nice condition. You get a nicer condition. And this condition will be satisfied by algebra homomorphisms. So th this is like indeed something that's new. Oh yeah, like so, okay, so here's the deal. Um, Carlos. Um, yeah. It's good that we did this. Okay. So now, assume that this half thing wasn't there. Right. So then 
we, we should be so in order for f plus g to be a one dimension we get this like we get this like this should be true uh, because this was the actual terms you were talking about and in order to it in order for it to satisfy rhs equal to rhs these terms should vanish uh, but now by the by by just the introduction of half over here f a b and f a b but this these do not cancel each other so earlier we would just cancel them because i would get one over here and one over here i wouldn't get a one by four the reason i get a one by four is because i'm multiplying over so it's like a squaring operation so this is in in, in a sense using the fact that it's quadratic right um this is this, yeah this is this is definitely a nice thing um uh, so i get this condition or if i just remove um um if i just if i just let us remove the thing i get this like if so if and only if so this is true if and only if f plus g is one derivation sorry is one derivation given that f and g are one derivation for all a b yeah yeah, right. Um, yeah, we just wanted earlier we only got these two terms when when we didn't have the plus by two, like division by two. So now we have these terms as well. And this in, in a sense. I guess it, it does make it nice, doesn't it? Um, like, but yeah, some more fun. symmetry, I guess. Yeah. Um, this is, if I simplify it, this is. Um, did I do this? I feel like this is wrong because um, phi minus identity, if f is like phi one minus identity and g is phi two minus identity. Oh wait, no, no, no. Well, we did it wrong. We this is very incorrect because the sum of two algebra homomorphisms is not an algebra homomorphism. The sum of two linear maps is a linear map. <laughs> like this doesn't respect the multiplicative structure. Like this is not this. No, no, no. This is yeah, yeah. We were so close. Uh, no, but I think this this introduction of this half thing, like it does make some sense because it kind of compensates for the extra quadratic term in a, in a way, which I think is nice. Okay, right. So, so I see. I think my <clears throat> I was I was mistaken. That's fine. Even I even I didn't like. No, no, no. I, I think yeah. I I I misremembered that the. I mean, I was assuming that the phi's were additive and preserving the unit and not just. And, but yeah, obviously. I wrote it. Yeah, I mean, I made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. I wrote no, no, it you, you have to be multiplicative, obviously. That's, that's what my point is. Um, okay, well then, I mean that. I did a better. For some reason, I've never thought of that. Uh, 
the, the somewhat uncomfortable fact that uh, multiplicative maps are not additive. Yeah, they're not. Uh, it fails for exactly the same reason why why W derivations are not closing the addition because of the quadratic one. So addition of two algorithms also have these extra terms that causes it to not to fail them. Yeah. So it seems to like, me that there is a. So I was I was chatting this morning to um, to JS. Uh, this, uh, this oh, postdoc okay. in Australia, and it, it, we, I, I told him, okay, what about this perspective uh, we discussed last time, where we, where you have add r be the triple binary algebra of any ring, where you have addition, point-wise addition, point-wise multiplication, and composition of of your endomorphism. And in there you find ring homomorphisms, uh, additive maps derivations, yeah. uh, weighted derivations, you find all sorts of things. Right? Um, and the question is, what part of the, of the, the algebra, so the, all those definitions are, are so all those operations are defined for general um, additive maps. Right? Um, so the question is, what algebra should you be taking uh, in that space for the kind of things that you're interested in? And normally you say, well, I'm interested in there are things like derivations, so I'm going to take things to be added. Um, but yeah. What what I'm curious, like, what, what did he say about the? Uh, wait, was he the one who wrote the papers that you sent, or? No, he's not the author. He's he's not the author. Oh. Um, so I mean, like, if he's an expert on W derivations, like, he must know like a lot about them. Well, yeah, yeah, but but this this was the, I guess I can report for the benefit of the viewers and and the update. The good, so it's good news and bad news. The good news yeah. is that there's a lot of original work to be done. The bad news is there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> <laughs> like, did he say explicitly that it's like, like we don't know that there is yep. a formula that exists? Yep. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. So he said explicitly, uh, we, it is unknown in the literature whether this differential, this weighted differential operator satisfy anything like a Leibniz identity, sorry, like a, like a Jacobi identity, something like uh, forming a Lie algebra or something like that. He said, a very interesting question is whether weighted derivations form a weighted Lie algebra. We don't know what a weighted Lie algebra is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. These are, the, these are in fact, like, this was the next thing I was um, yeah. coming to. So anyway, yeah. so I think what what I I I, I, mean, I think you did a yeah yeah that that's the question that we posed. I don't know if you remember that, that but that's the question that we posed in very in the first live stream actually. Um, oh, okay. Where 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 I actually made a mistake in a computation, and I thought I had to, I had shown that um, that they had a Lie algebra structure because I, I basically you know. I think there was a symbol that was flipped or something because I was writing in the table. Okay. And, and I made a mistake and I thought it actually worked out, but I didn't. Um, so so that's, the, that's, that's, been the, that's been the guiding question because if you're able to find an algebraic description of these things, um, then it's the whole, the whole program that we're trying to do, which is, you know, you try to uh, have the same object for different structures. So anyway, I think this is great. This is great progress. Having having ex explored the single variable case and having found this, uh, you know, learning the lesson of in that, in that situation, the general example of, uh, uh, let's call it, uh, so uh, subs, uh, minus minus home or something, you know, the home minus identity for, to give them a, a generic name. So, so, so this, the, those are always, of course, those are always cases of derivations, right? If you give me a, yeah, they're, they're going to hold in all algebras, but in K of X, it turns out that they're the only. They are, they are all, the, they are all of them exactly. So, so that, that we found a nice correspondence between zero derivations and one derivation. So it's all good for the one variable, but the one variable yeah, sure. says nothing about the algebra question because yeah. the algebra is missing in 
in the in the in the one variable case. So I would say the next focus yeah. is to try and the two go go after the two variable case and essentially try to see what these things are in yeah for sure uh, just, I'm excited to just, just from principle right because I imagine that you're gonna find something that is quite different um, that, okay that is not that is not okay. gonna and and yeah it, it, just keep it as simple as possible you know polynomials finite polynomials into variables like the, the simplest possible thing um, and and just define define the weighted derivations on them abstractly and see how much you can you can guess from from their structure and yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, I think that's a. I think that was a. That, that's a very good update point. Um, because Jonathan is not around, we can't really discuss uh, the automated search. I think I, I would. I would not spend time without him around because he knows sure, the, yeah. the back. The back. Uh, back that's better. Um, yeah, I, I tried to I tried to do that, but like I was getting some weird errors. So I guess we should. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That. No, no, that, that that part Jonathan should be involved, and we should do it probably live for the first time, and then follow up. Um, what I want to mm -hmm. want to mention is uh, I put a couple of so I created an algebra uh, folder in the library in the library channel okay. in, on Discord, and we. Uh -huh. So I, I added some of the papers that we, I mean, for this uh, Roda back sort of stuff. Yeah. Specifically, and this is one particular thing to look at, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be looking at this at some point as well myself. It's uh, to to understand the dual number construction of derivations. So, um, so the, so dual numbers are this algebraic version of of taking. Um, First order approximations, essentially. Right? So you, you take your. Uh, should I stop sharing my screen if you like want to like show us something? Um, I no no. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that. So so there, there's the in those papers. It's not that I'm trying to show anything okay. particular. Right? What I'm saying is in those papers there's a there's something called the Horwitz uh, the Horwitz sequence, uh, the Horwitz series that you can that you can effectively use to. Do the, the formal analog of the power series. So it's, it's basically like using a power series or formal power series argument like you were doing originally. Um, and so the idea would be to, to try and, as, as we said, try and find the analog for for weighted derivations. Like he's uh, sorry, the person who wrote the paper deformed the operator itself. No. Oh, okay. Uh, what what exactly was so where the, is the, the so what, you, what they change is the is the is effectively what they change is the uh, multiplication oh. on the power series side. Okay, so like like the star product thing. That was really yeah. Okay. So so that's something that we could try to exploit. See see if that teaches us anything. I have to I have to basically learn this. Uh, uh, dual number construction because uh, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I, I haven't I haven't studied it myself. I've I've never heard of dual number construction. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I, I don't know. What doing. Yeah, dual number construction. Um, I think it's basically just quotienting your ring by by, by the, your polynomial ring by x squared. By x. Oh, okay. By the relationship. Like, by the relationship. Yeah, x squared equals zero. Like like this, maybe. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I was. I think I think you can find it. I mean, let, let me see if I if a quick search no. does it because otherwise we might be. No, so, but it's not working. It's not working. Yeah. It's not working. All right. I mean, in normal deformation theory, we just question it by by this and. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's. Okay. So you. You. Uh huh. Okay. Dual number is a. Uh, the real numbers are joined with a nil squaring element. Ah, interesting. Okay. Oh, so like. Okay. This thing. Basically, it's just a set of all, like. In this. With like the. The, like the multiplicative structure inherited from this. 
Yep. I don't know how that would be useful. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't exactly know. What no, no. So, so, so this is very useful because I mean, the, the, the thing with these dual numbers is that um, derivations can be shown to be. Oh, okay. I, I, I see. Okay, okay. So yeah, okay. Right. So yeah. Right, so right, this okay, is yet so... another, yet another avenue. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's essentially okay. So, my bad. Um, this was actually the first thing I looked at to understand double derivations. Uh, uh -huh, interesting. I mean, this, yeah, this is called a semi-direct product, essentially. Like, you ha you have an algebra, and then you join, like, an element epsilon. And then you show that A plus A times epsilon is, like, uh, the multiplication on that has, like, this nice property. Like, essentially, it's, it's like this, right? So, yeah, I mean, that's what motivated me to pursue the deformation theory approach, where you have, um, like... Yep. A to B to E squared, this goes to zero. Um, and so you get um, A1, B1 plus A1, B2 epsilon. So, so the first order perturbation is essentially just like, yeah. like this. Yeah. And this is like the, this is the derivation thing yep. that we have. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's morally what's going on. Yeah. I guess there were some nice theorems about these, which I mean, I I, mean, I don't know whether they would exist for um, like our our. Okay. Yeah. So. So this is so. You start with a bimodule, like, okay, let's forget, like, assume that this M is just A. And so you define a new multiplication in that, where it's like the Cartesian product of A cross A, which are the elements, and A1, A2 times whatever is this. And this is isomorphic to just this, where E commutes and E squared is equal to zero, right? So, yeah, this is, this is what it is. Um, and then there are some nice theorems about them yeah. as well. Uh, um, like the set of all derivations are in bijective corresponding to the set of all automorphisms of this. Yep. Uh, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I was I was trying to generalize these results, but it didn't work. For some reason. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So in that sense, that's the. That's the. One of the avenues that we could have explored. So maybe if you've explored it already, maybe we should. I haven't explored fully. Um, yeah. So in that case, something to keep yeah. in mind for sure. So okay. So here's what I I, I did in that direction, just to like. Yep. Yeah. Um. Okay. Just. Okay. So just give me like a minute to recap on this. Um, okay. Hmm. So, okay, yeah, so here's the thing that I did. Um, it's going to sound a little complicated, but hopefully. We can learn some sometimes. Hmm. I think of the best way to explain this. Um, so, okay, so we get a derivation. So in a very rough sense, we get a derivation by setting epsilon squared to zero. Yep. Let's try to set... So, how do we get a W derivation? Or like let's say a one derivation of simplicity. We essentially expand this thing out. Right. Um sorry. Um, I said we essentially expand this thing out. Right. And then we just set this to zero. Like that's the intuition. Yep. Over here, and then we have some or the, the GPU has like some automorphisms, like the automorphism group, and then 
those automorphisms are the derivations and so on. So, so this is the intuition. So to get a one derivation, I, I basically just put this b1, b2 here. Right? I put it into epsilon, and that's the intuition of having this. Okay. So now let's try to do the same thing. Or Uh, this might actually be interesting, right? Um, maybe explaining it a little bit now. Uh, actually, was it, I, I read somewhere that Einstein actually discovered his theory while he was teaching. Was that true? Or? I don't know. Uh, actually, yes. So, so I get a one derivation by putting the epsilon squared term back in here or treating the high order terms as being the same thing. Um, and to get the square terms, I do this. Right. So this is how I, I get like, so, okay. So I have a set of derivations, right? Uh, which satisfy this thing over here. Now, there, it, it turns out that there's a very nice generalization of these derivations um, themselves. So, uh, I, I can just, I've actually written out so, so. the generalization of these derivations. Um, yeah, so now, can you see my like, the notebook I have? Yeah, yeah. So now, forget about what I wrote. Let this be an algebra homomorphism where I define 5a as something like this. Then, for this to be an algebra homomorphism, so it respects the multiplicative structure, phi of a b must satisfy this. And so, I'll just write it down over here. So this is like a generalization of of these derivations. And when I said n is equal to one, phi one is like a one derivation. Sorry, it's it's a it's a normal derivation with weight zero, but it's like it, it's that. And then I can gen generalize all these weight zero derivations in a way where I get phi two is some other thing which satisfies this. It satisfies this idea. But Carlos, are you like following this? In, in a... Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I thought I was explaining it very poorly. So. Okay. So just like this, just by using the like the structure of, of the power series, how power normal multiplication works, derivations show very nicely. And similarly, you can say, okay, the nth derivation satisfies like this I'm going to use here. And then this, and obviously this also shows up here. So this equation looks very, like this thing looks something like this. I have a zero, two, one, one, two, zero. But so, is it, so, so just, so in order to get derivation, don't you need okay. phi zero to be identity or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just assuming that, yeah, like in order to get, in order for like the, it to be an algebra homomorphism, I just need this, to be an algebra homomorphism on itself. Uh, like in order for this entire phi to be an algebra homomorphism, mm -hmm. I obviously need the first, the like zero order elements to itself be an algebra homomorphism, phi zero. So normally we just take that to be the ending. Uh, and it also makes sense because you're like, in a sense, perturbing the entire thing. So you should start with the actual thing on which you had previously. Sure. So right now, I mean, I don't think it really matters. So I just took phi zero. But we can also get the other one. Sure. So, 
now we see that we also get the notion of a second derivation using this. So now my idea was that if I can get the notion of a one derivation by adsorbing, and that's the word I use, adsorbing the second derivation here, then what if I can get a notion of a one derivation, like the higher order one derivation, in the same way I get a notion of the higher order zero grade zero derivation. Mm -hmm. Where I adsorb this term into this, or, or like something, um, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. So, my idea was that this is a this is a derivation of order one. This is a derivation of order two, and this and similarly you can generalize it. So now my question was, can we generalize? W derivations, weighted derivations in the same way. So an order one weighted derivation is obtained by expanding this and putting this term in here. Similarly, an, an order two weighted derivation can be obtained by expanding this, uh, which I haven't fully expanded by the way, um, because I can get higher order terms as well. Sure. By expanding this and then absorbing all of these higher order terms into this. So maybe this is what an order two derivative is. Like, do you understand the intuition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, so, but so I'm still not, not seeing how weighted derivations are going to come up. I mean, this seems uh, yeah. a story that there is an obvious into... for it's clearly connecting with uh, with one with the zero derivations, but one derivations are not obvious how they're going to show up here, right? No, I'm saying like one derivation two show up, right? So let's say I expand this thing out and I get this, right? Over here, one derivation sorry, grade zero derivation show up by taking epsilon squared to zero. Now, how can one, how can we one derivation show up? Well, I can just put this in here. Like, assume that epsilon squared magically became epsilon. Like, assume epsilon squared is an idempotent. Right? Yep. So, then, this would just go inside here. Right? If epsilon squared was an idempotent. Yeah. So, so now, I'm, ask, I'm asking a question. So, is then that exactly what you want in the condition? Uh, what do you mean? Like, like, I'm just trying to visualize the, the formula. But when you take the product, and if you say that that this works, right? No, then, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it works. Oh, yeah. But uh, so like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, because we, we have limited time. Um, oh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand in what sense you say that you recover one derivations in this context. Just say uh, by, take, by is... taking epsilon squared as epsilon instead of zero. Okay. Well, that's so good. If epsilon. Sorry. Uh, that's good. That's 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 an interesting. I mean, that seems like so, a, another another step uh, above epsilon squared equals zero, right? Yeah. So it's a nice assumption. Over there, we took epsilon squared to be zero, but now we just we want it to be like. Uh, instead of nilpotent, we want it to be an iron Sure. That's like the only distinction that we make. So well, that, that looks very promising then, right? Yeah, maybe, like that's what I tried to do. Um, like maybe, I mean, I didn't really, okay. So just to like be completely truthful over here. Um, the thing that I'm explaining right now, like it's, like I'm trying to, okay. so. I could not answer the question of like how weighted, like the structure of weighted derivations. So mm -hmm. what I try to do is maybe like hunt for a more, even more general thing and maybe it showed up there. Right? So over here it showed up when I took epsilon squared to be like E, to be epsilon. Now if I look at the expansion of this, right, uh, I, I get this thing, right? So maybe I can do the same procedure that I did in the first case by taking epsilon squared to be an iron token and get an order two derivation instead, where instead of taking epsilon squared to be epsilon, I take epsilon cubed to be epsilon squared. Sure. 
and then similarly even epsilon four to the epsilon square. Then these things all go into here, and maybe then this is an order to one direction. This is an order to zero direction. Yeah, this this this, is, this looks promising. This this is definitely a, a path to to go into. Yeah, because maybe but, maybe if we just look for order one one direction, yeah. maybe it's hard. Maybe if I try to look for order n one or w directions, because well, but but I mean, at some it's at some level you should be able if this works, right? If this if yeah. this is the way to go, you should be able to. I mean, in the same way that the that you recover the zero derivations explicitly in in that context. There should, there should be, I mean, if this is to work out, there should be a similar construction. I mean, it doesn't mean there's the, the full story, but you say, you know, within this algebra, when you do this, you find, yeah. like, I, I just, I think this is looking promising and, and you probably, if it works as it seems to work, you should be able to write up like a few lines to, to explicitly say, let this be this, 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 do this, construct this, and here's a set of one derivations by construction, right? So... Yeah. So, so that's that's great. That's very exciting. So so if you if you can produce that in the next couple of days and send it to me, I mean that 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 would yeah, be. I already did this and it didn't work out. Like it worked out in a very weird way. Um, okay. Like, so you didn't get. So. Okay. So okay. So. I don't know what it means for it to work out. Like first, I need to do something. Uh, well, it's as so, simple as I mean, you're beginning with the same. I mean, you have the template of of the of the der of the derivations the zero derivations, right? Yes, exactly. And now, as you're saying, I'm just extending that to one derivations by absorbing these higher order terms into just like sure. just the square terms, right? So there's a precise way to do that for everything. And maybe, and it seems like a nice construction, like it seems interesting, right? Like it seems that there, like just if I continue this pattern, maybe the resultant uh, uh, like order n one derivations I get or based on interesting structure, right? Yeah. That was my question. So it's very clear that the order, uh, the order n zero derivations will be a very nice structure uh, because it's a set of the order n zero derivations show up naturally in this epsilon framework and also in this algebra homomorphism framework. Yeah. Now the order n one derivations, the weighted derivations can also show up naturally in this epsilon structure by taking item tokens, right? As we just saw and extending them to n by taking, by just saying that it stops after a while, the, the power of epsilon, like it also obeys, it can, it obeys some nice thing. So my question was that in one, in zero, in, in this is so confusing, in, in grade zero derivations, the order n uh, zero derivations have this algebra homomorphism structure, can we do the same thing? by starting with this epsilon thing, constructing the nth order one derivation, and then obtaining that as some homomorphism. So obviously, if I do this epsilon construction, I will get phi one, which is a one derivation, and I'll get phi two, which is like an order two one derivation and so on. Right? So can it be the case that there exists a map phi, which takes a to phi zero of a plus phi one of a and so on, sorry. So that phi a b is an algebra homomorphism. I understand. I understand. A... So anyway, we, we are short in time. So so just to just to wrap up oh, here. Okay. So I still don't fully didn't fully get. You said it didn't work out. I don't know what you mean. So do you get is phi one a one derivation? No, no. Oh, by definition, we have defined it to be a one derivation. So it obviously is a one derivation. Okay. Like so, have... so then, so then, so then, my 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 cautiously optimistic comment remains. I think this is this is worth expanding out, and we should, because I mean, I don't think we should fixate too much on on replicating the general, uh, okay. the, the general Maybe. notion, because here what we're trying to do is to, to gain intuition on um, first order derivations. I mean, the theory of higher order der derivations and the higher order differential operators is is relatively well understood. So. We have a lot of, of literature to go on to understand. So once we understand the, the weighted uh, first order case, it shouldn't yeah. be too difficult to have a lot of uh, avenues to go into a higher order. So I'm not saying you shouldn't. And you know, if you, you think this is, this is 
you know, faster or it gives a very nice uh, sort of outlook of, of, of prospect, absolutely go go for it. But if if you find, I mean, this, this is the first time that we actually are finding a one derivation explicitly in a, in a context by by setting some conditions like, like this either potency instead of nil potency, right? So, um, so I mean, if you if you can just uh, if you have that written up or you have that, I mean, just just send it to me and post it on on the Discord and and, and sure. so, so I can review it because uh, that's that's it, that's the that's important to, to keep keep on making progress. Sure, I, I'll I'll most I've I've only looked at the higher order thing, but I haven't looked at the iron potent case that thoroughly and see what I get like some generalizations of the semi direct product where epsilon is not important or unimportant. I'll I'll try to figure that out. Okay, okay. Uh, tell but me. I mean, all, all all I need is is a sort of a short explanation that, that that just replicates the. It's like an exercise of replicating the the, the zero derivation case with nil potency, but in this case, the one derivation case with item potency. So just, just that. Sure. I'll write them down. Perfect. Sure. That way, that way we can we can think of next steps. Sure, I can just send you the PDF of the notebook and I'll write it down and post it. Well. Perfect. All right. Well, um, thank you everyone who joined. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have a massive interaction because um, our, our my technological setup is a bit precarious until next week. But hopefully, uh, I will see you everyone uh, in the relaunch event. As I said, it's Tuesday next week around afternoon uh, Eastern uh, time in, in the United States. So. Um, we should um, see you all there and have a good time until then. Goodbye. Bye.